Welcome to another edition of Zeek in Action. I'm your host, Richard Baitlick. Today I'll be talking about capture loss statistics. If you are running a Zeek sensor and you are running any type of network security monitoring operation, you're probably wondering whether your NSM instance is dropping any traffic. It's important for us to try to capture as much traffic as possible uh, within obviously the technical and, and uh, political and legal frameworks uh, in which you operate. But if you think you're capturing the right amount of traffic and then you find out that there are big gaps in what you've collected, then you're in for all sorts of trouble. You may find that if you're trying to extract a file, that the file is not complete, and as a result, you're unable to analyze it using your, your host-based forensics methods. Or if you feel like you're trying to write uh, transaction logs, you may find those transaction logs to be incorrect because all of the traffic wasn't seen. Or if you're trying to generate uh, judgments via an intrusion detection system, you may find that you're missing alerts because the traffic was just simply not present when uh, Suricata, or Snort, or any of the other IDS engines tried to inspect traffic and something was missing. Uh, now you can find yourself losing traffic for many reasons. Uh, it can come from the source of the activity. So for example, you may find that there's just simply a, uh, a bad link that you're monitoring and you may have discovered that that's simply because uh, you're watching uh, a problematic, uh, you know, low-level network issue. You may find that the hardware that you're using to capture traffic is the problem. In other words, your, your packet broker or your span port or your network tap is not configured properly or oversaturated or whatever the condition is, is that it is simply not providing all of the traffic to your sensor. And then finally, on the sensor, the, it may have issues. It may be uh, misconfigured. It may be underpowered. Uh, for a variety of reasons, your sensor can uh, fail to capture all the traffic that you need. Now, uh, Zeek is not going to be able to necessarily tell you exactly what the source of the problem is, um, but it may be able to tell you that there is a problem. And of course, that can be just the first step towards trying to fix it. If you simply don't know you have a problem, then you know you can't really do anything about it. So uh, Zeek provides something called the capture loss statistics script to help try to determine if uh, there is an issue. So why don't we talk a little bit about that? If you go into the Zeek documentation. You'll find uh, a script under policy misc capture losszeek And the description for this script talks about uh, reported loss being computed in terms of the number of gap events. Acts for a sequence number that's above a gap. Now, the first time you read that, it may mean nothing to you uh, <laughs> uh, because it seems a little obscure and technical. Uh, but what it's what it's referring to is that uh, Zeek is relying upon a, an aspect of the transmission control protocol or TCP in order to make an estimate as to how much traffic is being dropped. So what does that mean? Well, uh, transmission control protocol or TCP uh, is one of the core internet protocols. It's one of the oldest internet protocols, and it is a stateful connection oriented protocol meaning that uh, built into the protocol are mechanisms for making sure that the bytes of application data that uh, the sender and receiver are transmitting are uh, sent and they can be reassembled in the proper order and none of them are lost. This is different from something like uh, uh, user, dat user datagram protocol or UDP uh, which does not have those capabilities. And if you want uh, your data to arrive uh, properly, you need to provide those capabilities at the higher level. So above layer four, you know, five, six, seven uh, in the stack. So what this means is that if you have TCP traffic that you're watching with your Zeek instance, Zeek can try to determine what's happening by watching the uh, sequence numbers, uh, particularly the acknowledgement numbers, that are passed, and by looking for gaps in those numbers, Z can estimate uh, packet loss. 
So that's pretty cool. Um, it's important, though, to, to recognize that there's a couple of limitations to this. For one, uh, let's say you're watching a link that is mainly UDP. So you're watching something that has like a modern protocol like uh, uh, Google's Quick protocol that runs on top of UDP. Uh, Zeek, if it's relying on sequence numbers in TCP traffic, is not going to be able to tell you anything about drop traffic that's uh, using UDP, using something like Quick, or simply if it's a if it's a more traditional UDP-based protocol, um, Zeek isn't going to be able to tell you that there's loss associated with that. Now, uh, because TCP is a core protocol, uh, for example, well, HTTPS runs on top of, of TCP, uh, chances are you're going to have a ton of TCP in any network that you're monitoring. So I would say in practical terms, um, you're going to be able to use these capture loss statistics to be able to tell that something is happening. And you'll be able to use this facility to at least point you in the right direction about having uh, a loss of traffic. So how does this uh, how does this TCP sequence number thing actually work? Um, I wanted to point you towards a couple of resources if you wanted to do a little bit more in-depth reading on that. Um, I've got one example here. This is from uh, my first book, The Dob Network Security Monitoring. On pages, I believe it's 127 to 131, I talk about uh, sequence numbers. And I talk about how when they're shown using TCP dump, uh, what they actually mean. So here, here's an example. This is uh, packet four and a sample trace that I had there. Um, yeah, you can see the push flag is set. And then there's this one uh, colon 40 and 39. And what some people used to think was uh, this meant the bytes of data that were in this in this uh, TCP segment were numbered one through 40 and there were 39 bytes of data because they would subtract uh, one from 40 and get 39. Well, that's not right at all. Um, what this means is that there are th indeed 39 bytes of data in this segment, uh, but they're numbered one to 39. And this uh, is a relative acknowledgement number, um, uh, relative meaning that uh, TCP dump has taken the raw acknowledgement number and put it into something that starts with one and then increments from there to make it easier for analysts. Uh, and what this 40 means is that the next uh, segment that is sent with application data, uh, TCP expects, or, or in this case, TCP dump expects that the next application byte will be numbered 40. So this means really that there's bytes 1 through 39 and byte 40 is expected next. And the ACK1 means that the uh, this side of the conversation is still waiting for that first byte of data from the other side. So um, these numbers, we can use them to try to see if traffic is being dropped. Because if you're seeing acknowledgement for data, uh, but then you're not actually seeing the segments that have that data, there are gaps in these acknowledgement numbers, that's essentially what Zeek is doing. So uh, what does that look like? So what I did was I, cre I tried creating a whole bunch of different traces, and I had all these grand plans to show all of this data, and I decided it just became too complicated. So I, I concentrated my analysis on a single FTP control channel where I FTP'd to, uh, and I did this in using FTP because it's clear text and it makes it easy to look at, uh, and the control channel was small, so the data was pretty easy to look at. So when I did that, and we'll take a look at uh, the trace here using uh, Wireshark, here you can see uh, a pretty simple straightforward clear text FTP control channel. So destination port 21, um, you've got your three-way handshake, your SYN, SYNAC, ACK, and these are all using uh, relative sequence numbers. So for example, if I take a look at the first uh, segment here, and I come down into the, the TCP layer, and let's scroll down a little bit, there we go. Wireshark, you'll notice, says uh, sequence number zero, and it says it's a relative sequence number. If you want the actual sequence number, it's down here, and this is the decimal version of it. And below that, you've got the hex representation of that same number. The same is true here of the acknowledgement number. So uh, it turns out the acknowledgement number here is zero, both in the um, relative and in the raw number. But as, for example, you go into the SYNAC, 
you'll see that now the other side has set its sequence number. It uses a different uh, initial sequence number. And uh, you've got uh, the relative terms here as well to work with as well as the raw ones. So uh, most people use these relative numbers when they're looking at data because it's easier for us as humans to start with a low number like one and increment from there uh, as opposed to starting with a number like uh, 4202, et cetera. Uh, and trying to increment. It's just tougher for us to keep track of, of that data. So we have the, uh, the three-way handshake, SIN, SINAC, ACK, and we have, incidentally, um, if you want to look at the real, real deep details on this, I talk about it in my book about how you actually have a sequence number consumed by uh, the three-way handshake. So for example, the, sequ the relative sequence number here goes from zero to one, um, even though no data has been passed. Uh, this is simply because it's a way for TCP to make sure that this three-way handshake has taken place. Um, after this point, the sequence numbers will only change when data is being passed at the application level. That's kind of a subtle point. Uh, you know, it's good just to file it away. Um, the data, uh, all the action is going to take place uh, going forward. So, for example, the first data that gets transferred occurs here in uh, segment four where the server is reporting, um, let's see, let's show that right here, this message. This is ftp0.nyi.freebsd.org hosted at nyi.net. And uh, those, that's the data right there. And there's 55 bytes of data right there. If you wanted to, you can even count it if you like, but we don't have to worry about that. Um, let's just believe that's what the case is. So 55 bytes of data. And you'll notice that the next segment here says ACK56. So this means that it has received bytes, uh, the TCP stack has acknowledged receiving bytes 1 through 55, and byte 56 is what it expects to receive next. Now, the client tries to log in here with uh, user anonymous, and that's a TCP payload of 16 bytes. So you'll notice that when the uh, server acts it, it says uh, an acts uh, 17, meaning it's received bytes uh, 1 through 16, and the next byte of data it receives or expects to receive from the other side is 17. And this continues. And what's kind of nice about uh, using Wireshark in this respect is that as long as you don't see any error messages, which generally come up as uh, dark highlighted lines in Wireshark, then you, you're not having any, um, any, any loss. So in this, in this trace, in fact, let's just, I'll just go ahead and rebuild it so we can watch the TCP stream. So essentially what I did in this trace was I log into this uh, FTP server uh, as user anonymous, password anon, and then you can see the server reports its banner and such. Uh, my system does a couple of commands in the background that I, uh, I, you know, I didn't enter a syst command. I did use the passive command from the command line um, so that uh, I was using passive FTP as opposed to active FTP. Um, I did do an ls command. Now, notice I typed ls, but it got transferred or transformed by my uh, application into the list command. Um, I changed into the public directory and I get a directory listing. Now, uh, notice that it is not here in the control channel. The way that FTP works, the data that's being sent gets sent out over a data channel, which is separate. Um, in fact, if you wanted to see that data, uh, you would have to look at a separate interaction, a separate uh, TCP connection. They would have that information. Uh, I didn't include any of that here because it's all separate. We don't have to worry about it. Uh, but uh, my first book actually has quite a bit on how to interpret all this TCP, uh, or sorry, FTP information manually. Uh, because you know it was a hot thing back in 2004 when I was trying to explain how this worked, and especially when you were dealing with active and passive FTP and how intruders could uh, hide their activity and looking like uh, certain types of FTP connections and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so you've got this transfer. You eventually end up in this uh, uh, FreeBSD directory, the releases directory, AMD64, 13.0 release, and I retrieve this kernel.txz and uh, also, I retrieved an ISO. So my initial thought was, well, I would try dropping some traffic from this ISO, and then I would take a look at it using Zeek, and we would find out what we, what we had to work with. Uh, but it turned out that there was, uh, there was uh, 
retransmission going on just normally through through TCP, uh, not necessarily caused by a traffic drop. Uh, and that, I thought, made things a little bit difficult to try to understand or try to demonstrate what I was trying to do in this video. So instead, I decided just to focus on this, on this activity. So we have our, our FTP command channel. Um, we can see that it looks like everything got transferred properly. We don't see any, uh, any warnings of any kind. So uh, why don't we compare that with something that has been uh, corrupted? So corrupted, what, what am I talking about? Well, what I did was um, I used a tool called EditCap that comes packaged with Wireshark to uh, drop traffic from the trace that uh, I was working with. So what I did was I took my initial trace, and this is what it looks like incidentally using TCP dump. Um, you'll see the, uh, it, it shows the acknowledgements in, in this manner here. I took this trace and I used edit cap and I started dropping out um, certain segments from the trace. So I dropped uh, packets 11 through 20, 31 through 40, 51 through 60, 71 through 80, and 91 through 100. And I believe in total there were to begin with about 155 packets in the original trace. So by dropping out these, to, to, I think about 50 packets, I lost about a third of the packets in the trace. Now, losing a third of the packets may mean I lost more or less than a third of the data because we're talking about packets here. We're not talking about necessarily how much data is in them. So that's something to keep in mind when we're, we're talking about this. Now, when I take a look at the data here in TCP dump, Nothing jumps out at me. I can't just look at it and say, oh, uh, you know, there's a problem here because TCP dump isn't doing any type of analysis on the sequence numbers that are involved. Um, so in order to figure that out, we need something like uh, Wireshark, which makes it a little bit easier. So if you go to Wireshark, in fact, let me just compare these two. So here is the, um, the first trace and you can see, you know, no issues. If I go to the modified trace, Right away, starting with uh, frame 11, you'll see that it says TCP act unseen segment. And if you want to see why the, this is, let's take a look at the timestamp on this on this segment. Uh, 1822, 26, uh, 45, 8878. If I go back to my original trace, you'll see that that is actually segment 21. So I told you that when I did my mangling of the original trace, I dropped out 10 frame uh, segments or 10 frame sections from the original trace. So for example, I essentially removed 11 through 20 and 21 became the next in the, in the sequence. So that's why when I come over here, uh, Wireshark is smart enough. It's doing this analysis and it's saying, hey, you are acting data, application level data that I have not seen yet. And that's an issue and it does the same thing here. Um, so both on the client and, and, the, and the server side. So this is an indication that there's a problem. Um, Wireshark is smart enough, it, do, it can do its TCP sequence number analysis. And as we scroll through the segment, you're gonna see the same sort of, sort of thing occur again. After you get 10 frames, there's another one of these three frame segments where Wireshark is complaining, hey, some traffic has been dropped. Um, you know, this is a problem. And again, and again. And again, because I dropped out five sections of traffic from this trace. And if I scroll down to the bottom, uh, it's 105 frames. Uh, the original section, or excuse me, the original trace had 155. So I dropped out 50 frames in my, in my new trace. Okay, so that's been some setup here. Let's see what uh, Zeke can make of this. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just gonna, by the way, I'm using Brim. Um, this is version 0.24 of Brim, I believe. Let's just open up the first PCAP and see what it tells us. It's gonna be pretty boring because uh, this is just a single FTP control channel. Let's see what we have to work with. Um, okay, so here we have some logs that uh, Brim has created. And if you go to the, okay, let's do a refresh there. 
Okay. If you go to the capture loss output, you'll see that there were no gaps, zero gaps, 93 acknowledgements, and no traffic loss. And uh, that means that as far as Z could tell by taking a look at the sequence numbers in the TCP segments, all of them were accounted for. So there were no gaps, there were no segments that said, hey, I saw data, and yet Zeke didn't see the, the corresponding traffic, so everything looks okay. Um, I will say I'm a little surprised that uh, there's so many of these other entries. Like, let me just take a look at some of these here. I mean, some of these make sense. I'm wondering what some of these other records show here. Anyway, I guess this is, I haven't looked at FTP and Zeek in years, uh, so uh, I just chose FTP for the reasons I said earlier, um, but it's interesting that it creates so many of these records. That's, I guess that's something for, uh, for another, uh, another video, perhaps. In, incidentally, in the wild, if you're using FTP, you know, this is a sort of protocol you probably want to replace with something like uh, SCP uh, or another, another encrypted protocol. Um, you know, an anonymous FTP server transferring uh, the the files associated with a operating system distribution. That's that's okay to transfer over FTP, especially well as long as you validate that the file you got is the one that you expected by hashing it later on, uh, and so forth. Anyway, so this is what we have. We can see we've got uh, no traffic loss according to a capture loss script in Zeek. So let's open up the other trace that has all of the drops in it. Let's see what Zeke has to say. Remember, this is the trace that uh, instead of having 155 frames, this one has 105 frames because I've dropped out uh, 50 of those frames by using edit cap. All right, so it says the import is complete. Let's go ahead and refresh, and right away, if you see something red, maybe it's an issue. Sure enough, we have a notice, and the notice says, this is a capture loss note, too much loss, and the message is the capture loss script detected an estimated loss rate above 13.846%. And this is simply uh, the result of a script that is watching the output of the capture loss script, I believe. And if we look at the capture loss script, we see that it is reporting that there were 65 acts and there were nine gaps with a percent uh, resulting in a percentage loss of 13.84%. Now, we could try doing some math here and try to say, you know, okay, well, I thought I had like a third of my packets were dropped, but again, this is based on sequence number analysis. So the sequence numbers, we'd have to take a look at the bytes of data that were lost as a result of these frames not being in the second trace, and that would give us uh, some idea of how this was calculated. Of course, if you're a programmer and you want to take a look at how Zeek is doing this work, you can take a look at the scripts and you can do that yourself. Um, as more of an analyst myself, I try to take more of an ex experiment-based approach, and that's what I did with, for this video. Um, so that's, that's the basics behind the capture loss script, um, how you could potentially use it in your environment. Remember, this is based off of TCP traffic. If I had thrown a bunch of ICMP or UDP into a trace and got one set of statistics, and then if I had edited it out or dropped it out in some other manner for a second trace, chances are there would be no difference as far as how Zeke uh, observe those two traces because it is doing TCP sequence number analysis. It is not doing it uh, using some other mechanism. So, uh, and, you know, and, and when you think about it, how would it know? How would it know that uh, it's losing traffic unless it is doing some type of uh, other protocol level analysis of the data that's available? So that is all for today's Zeek in Action video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to see more videos, uh, please contact us at the uh, Zeek Slack or the Zeek mailing list or any other of the other methods that are available for contacting the uh, Zeek community. Um, always 
interested in hearing from people who use the software. If, if you're interested in creating your own video, uh, please let us know and we'll, we'll help you out. Uh, so for today, uh, good luck using Zeek and I hope you use your network security monitoring operation to find intruders and stop them before they accomplish their mission.